I want to introduce Daniel Mosset, from, who founded, one of the co-founders of Machinellas, and he's gonna to talk to us about querying your database in natural language. Let's give him a hand for being here, for all of us. <laughs> okay, hello everyone. My name is Daniel Mosset, I work at Machinellas. Uh, we are a company based in Argentina which builds data processing solutions for other companies. And I'm not a native English speaker, so please just wave a bit if I'm not speaking clear, clearly or just not making any sense. Uh, the topic I want to introduce today is about the use of natural language to query databases. And I'll, I want to show you a tool that implements a possible approach to solve this issue. So let me start by trying to show you um, why this problem is relevant. The problem I discussed today is not about how to get data, uh, because if you're here, chances are you have more data than you can handle. The big problem we have today is uh, how to put to work all the data that comes from different sources and is piling up in some of some database. And of course, uh, the first step, at, at least to to get started on, on on that work, is getting the data you want, which means making queries. And of course. You may want to do more than queries, but selecting the information you want is typically the first step in, in any data processing application. So this, there's a typical approach for large bodies of text-based data, which is the keyword-based approach. The basic idea is that the user provides a list of keywords he wants to look up, and the items, the documents that contain those keywords are retrieved by the system. But there are a lot of well-known tricks to uh, improve this, like detecting the relevance of documents with respect to each other and to keywords. There are some preprocessing tricks that you can do on the keywords and the index to find documents without an exact keyword match, etc. And this approach has proven very successful in many different contexts, with Google as a leading example of a database you typically query in using keywords. And this, this approach is, is everywhere. It works so well that you may wonder if there's any significant improvement that can be made uh, by trying a, a different approach. Keyword-based lookups are really, really good when you know what you're looking for. Typically, the name of an entity you're looking for or something uh, very closely related to that entity. It's very simple to look up information about Albert Einstein or figuring out uh, who proposed the theory of relativity, even if, if you don't remember Albert Einstein's name. But it's not easy to Google, what's the name of that place in California with all the movie studios, the, that place with the large white sign on the hill? It, it's a question that's uh, hard to answer using keyword-based lookups, because none of the words I use to, to make that questions are very relevant to the result uh, I want to find. It's not a problem of having the data. This, this is a problem if, even if I have a, a very good database containing a lot of movie studios and their locations. It's a problem of how the user interacts with the database. So uh, another problem of keyword-based lookups is um, that uh, is, keyword-based lookup is heavily dependent on having textual data. Uh, it works very good for the web, but if I have a database with flight schedules for many different airlines, doing uh, keyword-based lookups uh, wouldn't get me very very far. Um, it's, it's a very limited interface for making queries in that case. Even a database with a lot of textual information, um, like the schedule for this conference, uh, even if I have that, it's hard to answer questions like, which of the talks are given uh, by speakers uh, related to the sponsors without doing this manually? So the solution, uh, the canonical solution for, for these kind of problems are query languages. Uh, the problem can be summarized as, as finding something by the staff related to it. And there are a lot of query languages um, depending on how we want uh, to structure our data. All of them allow us to make uh, very complicated, very precise queries about the information we want to retrieve. And when I say we, I mean the people in this room. I mean programmers and data scientists. 
which is a weakness of this approach because this is not an interface that you can provide to end users. And there's a, a lot of people that need to access data and those people can learn or won't learn a complex language to, to access the information. Not because they're stupid, but because their field of, of expertise is another one. They, they have another knowledge and, and they can spend the time to learn these complex languages. So that brings us to the um, motivation of this. We need to query structure, non-textual related information in a way that does not require much expertise uh, for the person making the queries. A straightforward way to solve a need is allowing the data to be queried in the language that the user already knows. So natural language is nowadays getting as a very popular way to make queries and to enter commands. It provides a very user-friendly experience. Uh, even when most current tools are somewhat limited in the coverage they can provide. By coverage, I mean how many of the questions the, that the user asks are actually understood by the computer, are understood by the system, and answered correctly. Um, current, and the currently successful applications like the one I showed there um, are mostly uh, helped by having a guide where they say to the user, you can ask more, more or less these kind of questions and these kind of questions. So there, there is a limited list of questions that are valid. So let me, uh, after this introduction and the motivation for a problem, let me outline uh, where I'm trying to get with, with this talk. I'm going to sh uh, show you um, an approach uh, designed by some very smart people I work with, um, which is called uh, Kepi. It's, Kepi is a tool which implements this approach. And it's not the only possible one, but it has several nice properties uh, that are valuable to us in an industrial context. We are a company delivering to clients. And I'll describe this approach in general and get a quick overview on how to, I'll give a general description of each step of this approach and, they, and then give code examples on how this works and how to build a simple KPE application and the limits to the scope of the problems it solves and, and the things that I'll, I most like about it. Uh, just in case uh, you're here to see the code instead of listening to me, uh, all of it, it's, it's open source, it's available online. I'll leave this slide for 10 seconds so you can get a picture and then move on. And that also helps me with thinking that all you guys on computers are actually looking at the code instead of checking your email. Okay, so at its core, the KP approach is not unlike a compiler. It's an input-output function. The input is a natural language question, a natural language query. Uh, that question is um, first analyzed uh, automatically in, into separate parts. Those uh, parts are parsed by a set of uh, rules that build a data structure shown here, which is an, what we call an intermediate representation, which is in place converted to a database query, which is the opposite from KEPI. Um, the parser is guided by a set of rules which describes what kind of questions are valid, like as, as I said before, this works with, with a set of kinds of questions or valid questions. And the conversion is guided by some uh, declarative information. The conversion here is guided by some declarative information about the structure of the data database, the schema, if you, if you like it. Uh, and the application writer must define those, uh, those semantics. So we call this definition, those, that declarative information about your database, the DSL, the domain specific language. And as you may have noticed from the description, what we build is not an universal solution that you just throw on your database and, and have automatic results. 
it needs uh, uh, some customization work uh, regarding how to interact with the user, with what kind of questions are valid, and how to interact with your database, how to retrieve the data from that. So let's take a deeper look at the parser. The first step of the parser provided by Kepi is splitting the text into parts, process known as tokenization. Once it's done, you have a sequence of word objects uh, that contain information on each word. The token, which is the word as it appears uh, as, as a user enter it. The lemma, which is the, the base word, uh, the, the root word for the token, for example, if the token is speaking, the lemma is the verb speak. And uh, the part of, of speech tag, which indicates what grammatical function the, the word serves, like noun, verb, or something else. This list of words is then uh, matched um, against a set of question templates, like, like the one you see, you see below. The question templates are formed somewhat like regular expressions, uh, but with patterns not over characters, but over properties on this word object. So you can match properties of the token, properties of the lemma, and properties, uh, you can match over properties on the part of speech. So let's assume uh, the user entered a question, uh, it matched the question template, in that case, uh, the question template provides a little piece of code that builds the intermediate representation. The intermediate, the intermediate representation of a query is a graph like the one you see below. Uh, it's a small graph where vertices, vertices are entities in your database, edges are relation between entities, and both vertices and edges can have a can have labels or can be left open. If they have label, they match a specific entity or relation. If they are open, they can match anything. So uh, besides that, there's all, always a specific, uh, specific node, which is, the, which is called the root in Kepi. It's actually the, the node which contains the answer, the, the value that you are looking for. And this is an abstract and backend independent uh, representation of a query, uh, but it's mostly designed to work with knowledge databases which typically have this graph structure and allow matching of graphs inside them. Uh, Kepi also provides a way to build these trees from Python code in a way that's quite natural and based on semantic properties and things that make sense in your domain and it's not just uh, describing the tree structure top down, which is somewhat strange or unnatural. Uh, you, you compose little three, three parts together. I, I'll show you some example of this later. Uh, those components that you compose together along with the mapping, mapping of those components to, to the semantics of your database schema is what we call the, the DSL. So uh, from the internal representation tree and the DSL information, it's possible to automatically build um, some query string that can be sent to your database. Uh, we have built query generators for Sparkle, which is the de facto standard for knowledge databases, and MQL, the meta web query language, which is what Google's Freebase uses. And it might be possible to build custom generators for other languages or using some kind of intermediate adapter. I, I know that I haven't tried those, but I know that there are adapters that let you pull put a Sparkle endpoint in front of a regular SQL database. So that, that should work. And well, the DSL information needed here is somewhat schema specific, but it's, it's very simple to, to define in, the, in a declarative way. Let me go through some examples. Uh, we'll try to make queries on Freebase. Uh, with a couple of sample template questions. We want, to one, we want to answer questions like, what are bananas? And in which movies did Harrison Ford appear? And th don't worry about doing this on Freebase. There's no need for you to know the Freebase schema to, to understand this talk. We, we'll cover the information as we need as we go. Uh, I'm, what I'm going to show you is complete code, uh, but this is not a tutorial, so I'm not going to go over line by line explaining what everything does. 
Uh, the, the purpose of, of the code I'm showing is to give you an idea of what are the different parts that you need to put together and how much work or, or how little work is, is to build each part. So to build this, both these examples, uh, it's better to start with the DSO. We'll start defining some uh, simple concepts that look naturally re related to the queries we want to make. Let's take a look at the first class, the definition of class. Um, what we are saying here is uh, that how, how to get the definition of something. In Freebase, entities are related to the def definition by the slash common slash topic slash description slash description relation. Um, which it's actually an attribute, but in Freebase, relation, relations and attributes are essentially the same. So th that's why we say that this is a fixed relation that's the base class of the definition of. Um, and the reverse equals true uh, means that we actually want to fix the left side of the relation to a known value, and we want to learn about what's on the right side. If I, I hadn't used that, uh, this would be the opposite query. Given a definition, find out the, the object. So that's mostly all we need to, uh, to answer the first question, what are bananas? Uh, the other query we wanted to make is quite more complex. Uh, the database we have, Freebase, has movie entities uh, where each, movies can, each movie can have many related entities called performances. Each, per, each performance relates to an actor, to a character, etc. So we define some basic relations to identify the type of some entities using fixed type. I have defined it there is movie, which describes entities with the type slash film slash film, which are movies in Freebase. And I have defined its performance, which lets me find out those, those performance objects I just told you about. And to link those both type of entities, we have the performance of actor queries, um, which uh, allows us to query which performance has a, which performances have a given actor and has performance to allow us to query which movie has a given performance. Um, so the last thing we need is uh, this allows us to get movie objects which, which in Freebase are complex ent entities. So we want to actually show the name of the movie and the name of the movie is the slash type slash ob object slash name attribute of the movie, which is the movie title. So the, inter the intermediate representation that uh, we build for a query are actually a composition of instances of the classes I, I shown before. Uh, for example, given an actor A, the example on the right, uh, this, this expression below um, uh, gives, uh, represents the query which lookups movies where the actor A acts. So Note that the operations on the bottom are abstract operations uh, between queries uh, and, and build a larger tree. N none of this is actually touching the database yet. Just building this, this complicated tree. So um, let's take a look uh, how the parser uh, for the queries how, how the parser for the queries mentioned before is built. Uh, Let's focus on the first query first. Um, and we need to define for each kind of question what is called a question template. The what is question template is for the what is bananas question, what is a banana question. Um, a question template specifies uh, two things. The first thing is how to match the questions, which is done with, with one of those kind of regular expressions. And the matching has to be flexible enough to capture variants of the question like, what is x, what are x, what is an x, uh, what is x with a question mark at the end, etc. So you can see here that uh, we covered those things on the regular expression here. We have a, 
the, the one above says that we have a what-like word followed by some for, form of the verb to be, followed by some optional determiner. A determiner is a word like a, d, and etc. Um, and then followed by the thing that you, we are looking up, and optionally some punctuation like the question mark. Um, now that I said a thing, the thing we want to look up without being too explicit on what that means, because KP allows us to define particles, which mean pieces of the question that match a, a specific pattern and that we want to, to look up and that we want to capture. So at the bottom, I have defined the meaning of thing, what the thing is. The definition says uh, also in a regular expression that uh, we have an optional adjective followed by one of more nouns or proper nouns. And uh, we also give uh, semantics. Uh, in this case, I'm using the has keyword, which is capable in, which uh, essentially means the lookup, give me the thing with this primary key. Uh, it's shown in the, in the graphs as a dash line. So the question template also has an interpret method that builds, builds a tree. Uh, it uses the definition of the, that we just talked about. And uh, if, if we have an, a question that enters and says, what is a banana? It will match the real expression. Uh, both trees will be built and composed, and you'll end up with an intermediate representation like the object and the right. That corresponds to the right query that, after conversion, the right query that you need to make. Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, that, that doesn't cover. There are some prob th there are some problems, sir. I'll talk about those on the on the end. I, okay. I'm I'm covering those. And then the second part of my question is: so in your uh, thing particle rule, there's no uh, adverbial modifier. So you could say something like "very bright uh, car," right? And is it, you just ignore adverbial modifiers of adjectives. Uh, yes, you can cover all that. Uh, the, uh, these examples are actually part of a more complex application. I simplified those a bit to be able to explain these concepts more easily in the slides. Okay. But yes, you need to cover, you need to make a little more complex expressions okay, thank to, you. To, to cover all. Okay, uh, let's go to the more complex example. The first thing that we need is some specific uh, DSL, additional. Uh, freebase, in Freebase, there's no actor type. We have a person type and an actor profession. So we define what is a person, what is something that, uh, that works as an actor. And then that allows us to define Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this um, this that we did allows us to define the actual particle, which matches a sequence of, of nouns, uh, and represent an object that is a person, works as an actor, and has a, has an identifier that matches the name in the regular expression. So. You know how we build is person plus is actor plus has keyword build this more complicated tree below. So the real expression for this question is more complex because we allow several different forms like the one show at the bottom. Like he said, we actually need a bit more complex patterns. Uh, this is a simplification. Uh, but we allow several synonym verbs to be used, like star versus act versus appear, several syn synonyms like uh, movie or movies or film that can be used in questions. And we capture those as intermediate re regular expressions that we give names to. There's no need to build a particle for this because when the question is asked, I, I don't really care if the user said movie or film. The, the query I'm going to make is the same. 
but uh, one, one problem that is actually true is that um, when you do this, uh, some questions will probably fall out of, of your pattern. Uh, the good thing is that it's typically easy, uh, easy to detect uh, those situations and extend the pattern and enlarge this and, and increase coverage. Uh, actually, as, as I said, this is simpler than the, exam the example that it's in GitHub. So once you have captured the actor, you just need to define using the DSL how to answer the query, you, the query we wanted to make. And the definition here is, is very readable. Note that uh, we say, well, a performance is something that is a performance and of the actor we are looking for. Uh, then we find a movie with that performance or that one of that performances. And given that, we find the name of those movies. Again, I, explain this. I have explained this sequentially, but this is all steps in building this tree, not touching the database yet. So we end up with this complicated uh, tree quite, quite easily. So um, KP also provides some tools to help you with the boilerplate. That's not very interesting to describe here. I just wanted you to know that this exists. Uh, there's a concept of a KP application, which is a Python module that you can load with kp.install. And after that, you can use a method on, on the resulting objects to set the query and get the uh, database query that you have to send to your database. Uh, you can see that the approach we, we are using here is very simple. Um, it has uh, some good properties I'd like to highlight. The first one that's very important for us as a company that needs to build products based on, the, on this tool is that you can add effort incrementally uh, to, to your application and get uh, results that provide an immediate benefit. Uh, so this is very low risk. This is different from machine learning techniques or statistical approaches where you can use a lot of project time building a complicated model and you may end up hitting gold or you may end up with something that adds zero value to, to a product. So as much as we love machine learning where, where I work, we refrain ourselves from using this uh, because you, from using it because uh, we prefer getting something that it's not state of the art in terms of coverage, but it's a very safe approach, which is a great value which, when we interact with customers. So other good part about this is that um, extending or improving requests work that uh, can be done by a developer who doesn't need a strong linguistic or machine learning specialization. Um, that's, that has a good side to, that it makes it easy to get a large team working on improving an application and you can put many people to work on, on, at the same time on this uh, because question, question templates are really modular and not, they are not opaque models that you can touch piecewise. So this approach uh, we have found it works really well in domain specific databases. Uh, where there's a limited amount of relationships relevant to, to the data you have. Uh, because if you have very general databases like, uh, like Freebase or DBpedia, and you will want to know a lot of different questions, and the users will, will start making up questions that fall outside uh, your question templates. And that's a bit of, a, of the downside of, of this approach. If your database is too general, there's an explosion of the amount on, on relevant queries. And if you have really many rules, really many question templates, uh, you'll start having contradictions or interactions between those, those patterns, and that can be a problem. Uh, the limit here is, note not that the limit here is not the amount of entities in your database, the, how big data your problem is, but the amount of relations be between your entities. Um, something that it, uh, is hard to implement using this approach is if you want to add computation or deduction, answer queries like the, which is a square root of the distance between the Earth and the Moon, very useful. Um, 
but um, the latter part, the, the detection part, can actually be work around it by using um, knowledge databases that integrate deduction, so, so you just make the query and the deduction is done by the database engine. Um, some, uh, there's another problem which is more a limit of the implementation, not a limit of the approach. Our implementation at this time is not very fast. fast. The situations we have found didn't need to answer millions of query per, query, queries per second, so we haven't worried too much for that yet. <laughs> uh, but it's something that you need to take a look at if you need to provide a service based on this to a wide public. Um, and well, the, the last limitation, the last problem we have is uh, you require a structured database, a database with relations. Um, if you have a, a document database non-structured, which is non-structured, you have to use first uh, some information structure tool to, to build a database. That's, we actually started working on KP as part of a larger project, as a split of a larger project. I'm currently working on an information extraction tool that would work pretty well with this, but it's still work, work in progress. Feel free to ask me about it later, but it's not the topic of a talk. Uh, so that it's, I'm working on YEPI, which is the other half to solve this last point. Uh, so, um, as I mentioned, something that we want to do in the future is trying to integrate different databases, uh, not, not just backend, but different query languages as output, uh, work on performance. And something that we are researching is the ability to collect those questions that didn't have much, that didn't have coverage, and try to find similarity to existing ones using machine learning techniques to uh, to try to generalize the patterns and, and create new patterns for capturing the, question we, the questions we have. That's, that's the future work we are looking at. So that's all I have. I'll take a few questions. I have about five minutes. And you can get in touch with me later today or online about this or other related work. Thanks for listening, and thanks for the people organizing this great conference. So that's it. So I came in a bit late, so sorry if I missed this, but what application are you actually using this in? Uh, we have uh, this, we, we have been using this um, for some internal applications for some customers that I'm sorry, but I can't talk to you about because they don't let me, but yes. <laughs> I'm wondering if you've considered the role of context because in a single question, you have limited state, but if you have a sequence of questions or in a more traditional dialogue mode, you can get a lot more context. Is that something that you've thought about? Uh, no, actually we haven't worked with context. It's, it's an interesting question, but we are looking at, at separate queries and information that that there's no state carried between one question okay. and the next. Thanks. You know, when I look into this uh, natural language processing uh, space, there are so many different solutions, and this is this is something great, and I'm, I'm just thinking, um, did you look into, when you select your solution, did you look into other offerings like, you know, St Stanford has a great uh, partial for language processing. Um, so you took the NLTK, but did you look into that and do you? Uh, we actually, I, I was actually a bit on the side of a team that the bill is, that's why I said that very smart people who are with me. But uh, I, I don't know which other approaches they look at, but they did quite a wide research on, on different problems. And they, they were uh, a bit scared about the, the safety of different approaches. So for what we needed this, it was better to have a, a, a more naive approach, that, but something that provided us more safety and something that we could build on incrementally. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, 
Uh, it, it depends. It really depends a lot on on how domain specific is the database and wh how wide is the range of questions. Uh, so, yes, we can talk about seventy or eighty percent in a good case, but it depends a lot. We, we can get much worse in, in Freebase and Wikipedia. We have a demo online, which is more a demo of the conversion process, but. Uh, Freebase and DBpedia are very wide spectrum, so so the accuracy is much lower. The the coverage is much much lower. The accuracy depends on the data on your database, which we are not covering. Yeah, I have a, a question on both the first slide and the last slide, and it's maybe more a question of, you know, maybe the future, maybe the very far future. So. Uh, you showed this picture, right? This beautiful Hollywood picture, and uh, and uh, let's say today you show this to a human. Let's say, oh, where where is this picture? And the human brain would process it. Would say, oh, okay, that's in Hollywood, you know, California, United States, right? <laughs> so I would think naturally, when is it be when is it possible just to kind of upload this, kind of give this picture to Google and without typing any text, whatever, and Google says, oh yeah, that's, that's I, I recognize this picture, right? So where does it fit? For me, this look, this sounds more like a more natural, natural human way of doing things instead of still interfacing with the computer through, through a keyboard and typing a few words, right? Okay, so, so what's the question? Yeah, the question is, can I upload a picture today and saying, okay, Google, tell me, what is this picture? Uh, well, actually, Google does that, but the, this has nothing to do with natural language. Uh, but yes, there are image search software that yeah. pretty much... I'm not talking about <laughs> Google, I'm talking about... Yeah, so, uh, well, the reason why I mentioned Google, because I know Google does some of that stuff, okay? but. In what you're doing here, are you limiting yourself just to text-based, or are you considering things more than text, uh, going kind no, of pictures at, or? At this point, KP is just text-based. <laughs> yes, it's a big question. Uh, great. I think uh, let's give him another hand. Thank you. Thank you. And now, if you want a uh, keynote, it's going to start shortly back in Living the Dream, which is the building that you basically registered in. <laughs> With your sound, you kill the